Nobody compelled me to do it. I compelled myself. I know it might sound strange to you. You know what it's like when you study a language. All you understand is I am, you are, he is, she mm. is, it is. And so they take you through this really rote learning and you'll spend so much time and learn nothing. Dr. Peter Stoyanov, head of communications at Black. He's a part of the fabric of entrepreneurship ecosystem and innovation ecosystem of the UAE. He's played multiple roles across many different industries as an advisor, as a consultant, as a teacher. It's not to say that when we send our kids to school that what they learn isn't important, but it's that they don't understand oftentimes that there's a context for learning, for why you're learning what you're learning. And that makes all the difference. I asked my friend Jan, I said, how can I learn German quicker? He gave me a single piece of advice, which I still carry today and I'll share with you. I said, I wish you could speak slower with me so that I'm able to capture all of the points. And you know what he said? He said, if I speak slower. Peter, let me ask you this. People know you here also as a futurist. What is the future of learning? That's a really interesting question. Dr. Peter Stoyanov, the Hello. one, the only. All I can tell you is, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Peter Stoyanov is somebody I met many years ago before I received my Fulbright scholarship and went to the US. I met Dr. Peter at um, the Youth Hub in Emirates Towers. And when I met him there, I was just amazed by his intelligence. Uh, Peter started talking to me about quantum physics. And when he did that, I was like, I said to him very quickly, I said, whatever you're doing, I want to be part of it. I want to be your business partner. I know you and I are going to do great things together. He laughed and he was at that time, he had run his own company. And he's like, yeah, he's like, Look, listen, give me your number. Take my number. Let's keep in touch. And you never know what can happen. And Fast forward, I don't know, what, seven, eight years or something like that? About seven years. Seven years. And now here we are. We're working together. Uh, I can tell you one thing. I'm honored that Peter designed a beautiful brand identity for my company. And uh, it was only natural for me to bring the person who has done so much for the community here in the UAE. Um, he's literally a part of the fabric of the entrepreneurship ecosystem and innovation ecosystem of the UAE. He's played multiple roles across many different industries as, a, as an advisor, as a consultant, as a teacher. We, uh, you know, we're, we're here at Xeno Talks, uh, which is a, 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 an offshoot of Xeno Learning, all about learning. And, and uh, one person we can all learn from is Dr. Peter Stoyanov. Thank you very much for joining Xeno Talks today. Thank you so much for having me. It's really an honor and it's, an always, uh, it's always a pleasure. And uh, anytime there's an opportunity to, to take some time from the day to come and sit with you, it's always a pleasure. You know, Peter, whenever I tell anybody about you and I tell them that Peter is a, some, he did his PhD in quantum physics and everything, <laughs> you know, let, like, let's start, let us go back even beyond or before quantum physics. Like, tell us a little bit about yourself and your journey, both personal, academic, and then professional? Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll do it, I'll do it quickly. Um, so, as you can tell from the accent, I'm originally Australian and um, born to two Eastern European parents. And I was actually born in Australia, but culturally very much of that kind of Eastern European background. So, um, <laughs> it's funny. It's funny how things work, um, and it's funny where life takes you. But where my life took me was, uh, I was actually a musician before everything else. So I played, uh, I don't know even if you know this, but I played uh, saxophone. I started playing when I was 11 years old. You know, that's what I also play. Saxophone? Yes. Oh, my man. <laughs> <laughs> Not as good as you do, but I did. That's, well, the, that's I, the one instrument I learned fantastic. to play. That's um, yeah. fantastic. Well, for as long as we've known each other yes. to finally to finally find that out about you. And I think for you to find that about yes. uh, me, yet another commonality. Yeah, the, yeah. the universe has a way of bringing people together. It's a bit unfair because Peter does have a very, very jazz voice. 
So he could he could be <laughs> anywhere, and he, and yeah, he's he's a master of improvising any voice you tell him to do. Yeah, okay, we won't on. do any of that on this podcast. But if there's another podcast, we'll uh, we'll we'll will out some of those talents. Yeah, um, yeah, and and I was actually a musician, and it was heartbreaking to my parents when I told them. So I started at eleven, mm -hmm. and really accelerated through that process. Actually, my first um, degree was a diploma in music performance, mm -hmm. and I got that when I was seventeen years old. So I hadn't wow. even started. I haven't finished high school yet at that mm. point. And when I graduated, I remember I had a guy who was 55 years old on one side and 72 years old on the other. And I was 17 yeah. years old getting my uh, diploma. So we had that uh, presented to us. And from that point, when I got onto university, I think it was about choosing kind of the safer option. Mm. I was really into music and I would say that I was talented, but I was nowhere near as talented at the scientific disciplines. And I was always interested in physics. And I, I credit one teacher in, um, uh, in my high school time that kind of provoked this, this scientific thought process approach to life mm. that I really liked. Mm. And I would say that it's probably singularly, his name escapes me because you and mm. I are getting old now, but mm -hmm. his name escapes me. It'll come back to me at some stage. And um, he was really kind of pivotal in me deciding and choosing to, to go on and to study. Mm. And in Australia, you have the possibility of studying two concurrent degrees. So you study two independent degrees okay. together at the same time. And so the major of one becomes the minor of the other. Okay. So I did a degree in science and a degree in engineering. Mm. And so my degree in science had a minor in engineering and mm. my degree in engineering had a minor in science. Okay. So I was able to combine the two. Instead of spending eight years, I ended up spending five years. So as with a, with a significant overload. Okay. And then I got an offer I couldn't refuse, as, as you do sometimes. So I was doing this research project for my engineering studies mm -hmm. for, um, you remember this, for a toroidal electron spectrometer. And we had the only one in the world. So oh. you can think about this like the, the Formula One of scientific instruments. Okay. You know, they always kind of break down. Yeah, and yeah. They're really difficult. But mm -hmm. when they perform, yeah. they're like super high performance. So this, okay. was, this was kind of like that in the scientific discipline. So I ended up going to... Germany for the first time in 2004 mm -hmm. and the offer mm -hmm. from my professor was uh, well why don't you stay on do a PhD with me mm -hmm. and I can promise you that for the next four years I'm going mm -hmm. to send you to Germany four times a year oh wow he didn't keep his promise that actually ended up being much more than that <laughs> <laughs> so I've been in total to Germany from Australia 15 times wow. you can imagine yeah Australia being where it is in Germany yeah, yeah. that was a that and was you a are a fluent one. German speaker Well, we can talk about that. I didn't start off being one and yeah. actually studied uh, in high school. Mm. So we had a relationship with a German uh, school in Heidelberg. Mm. Um, and uh, so I actually studied German as a kid. Mm. And you know what it's like when you study a language, right? Yeah. So, so you learn a language and all you understand is I am, you are, he is, she mm. is, it is. And so they take you through this really rote learning. <laughs> And you'll spend so much time and learn nothing. Mm. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, yeah. yeah just the way that there's, there's something about formal education, particularly yeah. language, where I think it's useless. I'm doing Duolingo at the moment. I'm, okay. I'm studying Al Arabiya. Mm -hmm. And it's taking so long. Mm. And I remember just sitting with friends and getting them to teach me. It's mm. so much faster. Yeah, yeah. So something interesting about that. Interesting. So, you know, um, talking about learning, tell us a little bit more about, like, Quantum physics. What is it? What is the base of that of that program? Yeah. Uh, and what's the most significant thing that you studied? And 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 I don't know. Were you inspired by Oppenheimer? <laughs> I mean, it is trending right now. You made this joke two weeks ago. <laughs> I mean, yes, but I, I, it's still trending. The only reason yeah, yeah. I'm only saying it because it's still in the movies. If it's not, I would. And isn't it? And oh. isn't it good? It's so interesting that that movie was juxtaposed with Barbie, right? Mm -hmm. And um, Barbie still blew Oppenheimer out of the water at the box office That's from what true. I saw. But Oppenheimer did really well. And I think telling that story of a prominent scientist who mm. created something that he, he created something, obviously, that changed the world. Yeah. But to harness nuclear energy in yeah. the way that he did, I think it's a tremendous story. I think he's one of the most important mm. people in modern times right? yeah. um, in, in what he accomplished. Mm. And unfortunately, that amazing quote that he he gives from um, I'm going to say the Bahana Gita but mm. from the from mm -hmm. the Indian yes. um, uh, tradition mm -hmm. um, you know I have become the destroyer of worlds right yeah that's a, that's, that's a badass <laughs> <laughs> that's a badass way to say it I mean 
the the thing is that it's so happenstance how um, I actually got into you know from music studying science and then from science going really really deep, and I think it's a quest for understanding that mm. fundamentally kind of underlies it. So okay. when you when you the way that it was, I mean, it helped that I got these, you know, government paid trips and a government paid scholarship, right? It made doing it a little bit easier. Mm. And actually, when I got into it, it's a, it's an interesting story because I had no idea what I was doing. Mm. And my professor said, it's okay. I'm actually giving you an opportunity to spend the first year at a particle accelerator in South Berlin. Okay. And I got the chance, basically, he said to play. He actually said it like that, mm. um, Professor John Riley. I, I hope he listens to this. Mm. Um, he's been so pivotal. Really, we, we call in the German tradition, you call your PhD supervisor, your doctor father. Mm. So he's my doctor father. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I have two dads. No, that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> I have my genetic dad, my yeah. biological dad, yeah. and I have my PhD dad. Yeah. And, um, and one of the things that he, he said, and he was such an important figure at that time was giving the space and the opportunity to, to learn. And we actually fell in with a German research institute and that were also really uh, important. So we were two research groups working together. And I had a material that I was studying called silicon carbide. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that you could do something really interesting. So I had a, a different project about nanowires that I've explained to you uh, before. Mm -hmm. But what was interesting, my side project happened to be uh, working with this German group mm. about trying to discover graphene. Mm. And graphene is the world's first two-dimensional material. Okay. So it's a material that exists until then, theoretically, mm. nobody had actually produced it. Yeah. It turns out that we were in a race mm -hmm. with two Russian scientists called uh, Kostya Novozolov and his, his supervisor, Professor Andre yeah. Geim. Yeah. So they were also a student and a, and a teacher. Yeah. And they were researching this uh, as well. And of course, we, being of the German tradition, had a really difficult way to produce graphene out of silicon carbide. Yeah. And we, we use what we call the hydrogen terminator. Wow. So this is, a, yeah, yeah. This, is this, this device that pumped mm. 5,000 watts of light energy yes. into, a, into a tube. And we put mm. hydrogen inside and we would grow graphene. Mm. Um, and then we measure it in our, yeah. in our Australian machine. Yeah. And these guys figured out a method of using scotch tape to do it. Wow. And uh, they actually peeled the layers because one of the interesting things about graphene is it grows in layers mm -hmm. and you can very easily peel it, you yeah. can, what we call cleave. Yes. You can cleave it and they use sticky tape to cleave it from one side yeah. to the other. C could you also tell us like what is so significant about graphene? Some oh, people who right. don't know. Like what is what is that part? Like so what's – because I, I it, it, it did make headlines like crazy for the last decade. But tell us absolutely. what's special about graphene. Absolutely. So it, it has a unique property in science called ballistic electron transport. Mm. That's a really complicated way of saying something really simple. It actually acts as a perfect conductor. And you don't have to cool it and do crazy stuff like mm. these superconductors. So it has these really interesting electrical properties. And because it confines in a single layer, yeah. what it means is that you can create electronic devices out of it. Mm. What we were thinking uh, theoretically that would be really interesting, would have really interesting electrical properties. Yeah. So it would mean, I mean, faster computer processors, much smaller, mm. much less heat created, so you could stack more of them together. Yeah. So it would really redefine the landscape of electronic devices in a, mm. in a really compelling way. There was a race going on around the world. Yeah. And what was funny about these guys is actually the way that they discovered um, uh, graphene was in something they called Friday night experiments. Mm. And Friday night experiments were where they would spend a certain amount of time um, so they had scientific research that they did, and I read about this, and I'll tell you in a moment where it came from. But basically what happened is they would spend about 20% of their research time exploring some interesting projects mm. that were not part of their specific research. Yeah. And their research in graphene was part of those Friday night experiments. Mm. So as it turns out, like I was playing in the research that I was doing, they were also playing mm. in their own research as well. And so there's so much to say about learning when you're playing yes and even serious scientists like them go on to play so whilst we were playing with that material and trying to figure out its electronic properties they were using what we call the scotch tape method they actually mm -hmm. weren't using scotch tape but the name stuck mm -hmm. and so they discovered they had the first experimental discovery mm -hmm. of graphene and then they went on to to investigate its electrical properties yeah 
And we woke up, so this was 2005. Mm. I joined the group in 2006. They were doing their research in parallel to us yeah. along with a number of international collaborations. Mm -hmm. And on 2010, we woke up to discover that they won the 2010 Nobel Prize in Physics. No way. For the discovery oh of graphene. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. This is this is amazing. Yeah. Okay, well, no, well, that, I, I must say congratulations. You are somehow part of it. Somehow, yeah. I mean, for well, sure. Well, actually, the work that we did uh, supported their yeah. discovery. Yeah. But what's interesting about that is that they were first. Oh. But yeah. our graphene was German engineered, much better quality. But it really goes to show. There's another even funnier experiment. So I got I got into I got yeah. into learning about my um, competitors. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and I discovered that the Friday night experiments yes. where with this play actually produced a couple of other really interesting things. So. Andre Geim is the only person in the world mm. who's won a Nobel Prize and also something called an Ig Nobel Prize. Mm. So an Ig Nobel Prize is a prize that you receive for a scientific experiment that makes you laugh, but mm. then makes you think. So what did he win it for? Yeah. So he has access to this incredible super magnet. Mm. And what he thought would be a great idea mm. is to actually take a cup of water and pour it into it to investigate the magnetic properties of oh. water oh, okay. and discovered that it was actually magnetic. Yeah. And so what happened then was... Oh, so he, wait, did you just say water is actually magnetic? It has a magnetic property. It has what's called diamagnetism. So he noticed mm. that little bubbles of water, and, and this was not known, right? Yeah. Because it was, a, it was not expected in water that this would be um, the case. Mm. And so what he did was try to find an animal that had a lot of water inside it. Okay. So he actually took a frog, yeah. suspended it magnetically <laughs> inside this magnet and won the Ig Nobel Prize. So he's the only person in the world who's won a Nobel Prize yeah. and an Ig Nobel Prize. That's very interesting. Yeah, and, and just a quick sort of bookend to that. He talks in his Nobel Prize speech, you have to give a speech every time you yeah. win a Nobel Prize, and he talked about the fact that fun mm -hmm. was, and the Friday night experiments, yeah. the time devoted to play mm -hmm. was actually where they learned the most and where um, the most interesting scientific discoveries were actually had. Yeah. And that's very much the same for me. So to bring it back to, to what yeah. I was telling you earlier, um, it was really through the course of play yes. and through considered kind of discovery that yeah. the interesting scientific results that formed obviously the part of my PhD mm. actually came about as well. That is really, really interesting. And you know, as you, as you are aware, uh, Zeno podcast, Zeno talk is literally an offshoot of Xeno learning. Mm -hmm. and, and it's literally uh, a new platform that's gonna come out, that's gonna revolutionize the way people learn today. Whether they learn through play, they learn through engaging, through different uh, methods. Now, you know, if we want to dive in about how we learn and, and the, the power of learning as we see, you know, you know that there are two paths for learning. You've got your structured and traditional versus experiential and playful. You know, uh, one thing that I remember growing up, which was terrible, uh, you had to memorize like a full page answers. If you did not write your answer word for word for what you had to memorize, yeah. you wouldn't get a full mark or, or it would be completely disallowed. Like, you know, so give us your thoughts yeah. about the way learning is changing and evolving as we speak. I'll give you my personal experience and that's learning a language. So I talked about it before when we were learning German at school. Mm. It was all about, you know, regular and irregular verbs. And German has this crazy tense structure. So when you're when you're conjugating verbs, for example, the dog is der Hund, mm -hmm. the cat is die Katze, so the cat, and the table is das Tisch. So there are three gender structures, wow. masculine, feminine, and neutral. Arabic is much worse. <laughs> and then you have, you, have, you have four tense cases. So you have a matrix of male, female, neutral, plural, across four tense cases. So in English, you say the dog, the cat, the table, the yeah. people. Yes. In German, you would say der Hund, die Katze, das Tisch, den Leute. Wow. So the people. And then that multiplies by four. Mm. In Arabic, by the way, there are 12 tense cases. So I don't know why. <laughs> someone someone uh, uh, far more intelligent hey, look, than both of us will explain I'm, it. I'm just, I'm just bored so, with it. Thank God. But I'll tell, you, yeah. I'll tell you what will probably end up being a funny story about how I actually learned German. Because mm. I certainly didn't learn it in the confines of the classroom. Yeah. And I found, <laughs> <laughs> reflecting back on this, I had, a, I had a friend who I studied with. And I, went, I actually went back to live in Germany. Um, in around 2014, I think it was. 2000, sorry, 2012. 
And I remember that there was a, a young man who I studied with, who I was friends with. Yeah. And later, when I went to take my job interview at the company I used to work at in Germany, he was actually already working there, but we lost contact. So mm. we very quickly became friends again. And the way that it happened is that I made a concerted effort when I joined that job, because I had the seed of German, yeah. I actually planted that seed to everybody that I met. And I said, I know it might sound strange to you, mm. but although I'm an Australian, I actually speak German. Mm. I said, ah, oh, this is incredible. We've mm. never seen it before. Yeah. There you go. I did an accent <laughs> for you. So, so they never could have fathomed that an Australian from Australia would actually yeah. speak German. And I mean, they didn't know my history, obviously. But I could speak a little bit. And so what happened was that whilst I was doing a job, I was actually in like a 10 hour a day German speaking camp. Mm. And then what my friend and I would do afterwards, he of course, to, to get to know people, he invited me over to his friend's house mm. and we would play board games or card games. Yeah. And we do that at night. And what would happen is that they would make fun of me mm. in really amusing and funny ways okay. with German idioms. So they would say stuff that I wouldn't pick on pick up on and it really kind of tormented me in a mm. funny way yeah, <laughs> so yeah. i said i really okay. want to know what they're doing because yeah, they'd yeah. all laugh and giggle at these jokes yeah, yeah. and i thought man i'm pretty sure these jokes were yeah, at my yeah. expense yeah, yeah so what ended up happening is i asked my friend jan i said how how can i learn german quicker and he's actually quite quite an autodidact so he yeah. learns himself and he, and he actually speaks multiple languages very european and um he had a funny experience where he went to Korea mm -hmm. to learn Korean in English. And he spoke neither English nor Korean. <laughs> so he said he, oh he got goodness. a two for one. So wow. that's what he told me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I remember he said, he gave me a single piece of advice, which I still carry today and I'll share with you. Yeah. I said, I wish you could speak slower with me mm. so that I'm able to capture all of the points. And you know what he said? He said, if I speak slower Mm. with you, if yeah. I speak German slower with you, yeah. he said this in German, he said, what will happen is your ear will tune in to learning the language at that speed. And he said, the problem is that you'll need to unlearn at that speed to relearn at the proper speed. So he said, if wow. you just go through the challenge yes. and difficulty of learning German at the proper speed, yeah, yeah. you'll just get it. Oh, wow. And so that's what I did. So I committed yeah, yeah. myself. I took this advice on board, uh, very much a trusted friend, and we actually did that. Mm. And I remember that I was sitting with this group of friends a couple of months later and I actually cracked a German idiom joke to them. I looked at themselves and they were absolutely shocked. <laughs> and my friend Jan put his hand on my shoulder and said, now you can speak German. <laughs> and it's incredible wow. what was able to happen when there was a purpose to learning. Mm. And I think that's the critical thing here, that there was a purpose to learning. There was a reason for me to learn that thing. And... It's not to say that when we send our kids to school that what they learn isn't important, but it's that they don't understand oftentimes that there's a context for learning. Mm. And I found that through school that the best teachers that I had, I mean, so much so that the teacher that I had in high school was able to push me towards a career in physics. Yeah. The reason why that was the case was he gave us the context for why an understanding of physics was important to understand the world. And that's all they needed to do. It's just to set the right context for why you're learning what you're learning. And that makes all the difference. And I understood this mm. when I had to, I studied in second year um, mm. differential calculus. Okay. And differential calculus is a real pain in mm. maths. And it was a second year subject at a failure rate of 60%. What's the, what's the difference between differential calculus and calculus? It's... Uh, a particular type of calculus that only deals with differentials. So uh, differentials are you, it's basically a particular type of calculus. It's calculus okay. in a particular domain, which okay. is the really hard one. Okay. <laughs> I'll, put it, I'll put it that way. Okay. And Good. so, and so what ended up happening, I, I, um, I was as bad as everybody else at that subject. And there was one class where the teacher was kind of getting frustrated with us. And he said, do yeah. you know why you need to know about differential calculus? Mm -hmm. He said, imagine you have a barbecue. Yeah but the heat is only being applied on one side of the barbecue. This is a true story. <laughs> and he said, you have your steaks and sausages here. He said, if you understand differential calculus, you understand how the heat flows from one side of the barbecue to the other, and you can calculate it. So you know when to put your sausages on. And I said, I understand sausages and steaks. <laughs> <laughs> so I get what he's talking about. And, and it was funny because that flip in mindset yeah. suddenly 
made me understand, not that I saw every equation as a sausage and a steak, but, yeah. but it was that I understood why it's valuable to me. Yeah. And so much of learning is about that. Interesting. Yeah. I wish I had that kind of professor because, you know, I, I'll tell you one quick example of, um, so a very good friend of mine, uh, his name is Saman and myself, we were in our accounting class. And the funny thing with this, uh, Peter, is that we had two midterms and a final. The mm -hmm. first midterm, I am not kidding you. I remember <laughs> uh, Saman got like uh, 10 out of 100 and I got like 15 out of 100. Oh, man. <laughs> it was so bad. It was so embarrassing. It was like beyond an F. And we were like, we were shell shocked. We were like, what in the world happened? Like, how did we end up getting these grades? And then... And, and, and I remember every time I was sitting in class, we just did not understand what was going on. We just did not know. I've never received a mark that was that low in my entire life. I, I, I wanted to cry. I yeah, wanted 15 to, out of 100 like, is pretty bad. It, is, it, is, it was really embarrassing. I, couldn't yeah. have, I never told my mom this. I never told my parents about this, you know. Saman and I, we sat together every, almost every single day that day because we weren't actually that close. We were sitting next to each other and I, he, he looked at his paper and I looked at mine and, and it was just because it was a big, huge circle of an F on our papers and we looked at each other we're like, listen, if we don't put our act together, we don't get our act together, to, uh, then we're, we're finished. So before the second midterm, we sat together almost every day, like even beyond midnight, I remember sitting at this place called French Bakery. It was 24 hours. The only place that was like 24 hours at the time. And we would practice and practice and practice because that was the only way that we could learn how to solve accounting program because we just did not understand what the professor was saying. So the only, because we were under the assumption that whatever we're learning, then, you know, you can just come back one day and you magically answer the questions. But we understood if you don't practice and try these uh, problems, you'll never be able to solve it. Second midterm, what did we get? We both scored about maybe like 70, around the 70s. And I remember the final, like luckily I got like an 85 out of 100. Like that from, from a 15 all the way up, like it was magical. Like for me and him, like we feel like we, we, we feel we won the Nobel Prize. <laughs> <laughs> we actually did so, for that subject. Yeah. Isn't, it, isn't it amazing? Um, you can be... You can be compelled yeah. in a really positive way, yeah. but you can be equally compelled in kind of a negative way, right? Yeah. But you're still compelled. Yes. And one of the things that I found that I found quite stressful, especially at university, but it continued through my entire education, mm -hmm. was that you were compelled to do well, but kind of almost against, against kind of all your you know, hopes yeah. Um, you were compelled to 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 go to school to learn, but again, as I said before, without that context of why you're learning what you're learning, mm. I don't think that you can you can really go deep into a subject. Yeah. And it's an important point because when I was studying music, I, mm. nobody compelled me to do it. I compelled myself. Yeah. And when you're learning a musical instrument, what you're actually building, I mean, you know, this is muscle memory. So you'll repeat the same passage over and over and over again. Yeah. And you perfect tiny elements of it every single time. Yeah. And it's a search for perfection and only few people, I think, can do it. So when people are learning musical instruments, yeah. the ones that stay for it and do it are the ones who are patient enough to build that muscle memory. Yeah. Right. And it, I mean, you remember doing your scales, you mm. remember doing your, you know, your runs and exercises and yeah, all of yeah. these kinds of things to develop muscle memory. Yeah. Well, it's the same thing when you develop any skill set. Mm. You have to develop the mental muscle memory. Yeah. When you're playing sport, you're developing a physical muscle memory. Um, and it's not that you can't do the thing, but it's to be able to do the thing under pressure. That's true. So you played soccer, right? Yeah. A football. Mm -hmm. So when you play football, oh, sorry for saying soccer, it's yeah, such yeah. an Australian thing to say. Um, when you play football, it's not that you can't kick the ball, you know, towards the goal. Mm. It's that you have to do it when you have, you know, three people chasing mm. after you doing so. And it's being able to perform that skill set under pressure mm. that is really what you're working towards. And it's the same in every skill set. So when you're the, the place where I did my um, where I did my studies. That place did not come for free. Yeah. So although they deferred the cost, it was 20,000 euros a week to actually spend time on that particle accelerator. Yeah. And 
so we really had to have our stuff together. Yeah, mm -hmm. it wasn't the case that you just go there and do science experiments and yeah. play around. I may have couched it like yeah. that, but it was you know really concerted effort to build experiments and to build the kinds of experiments that you'd be able to explore this space of possibility. And that's a lot of pressure. Yeah. It was a tremendous pressure on us, and something that I did when I was 24 years old. Right, mm. I started early. You know, Peter, let me ask you this before we close. Sure. I also, uh, people know you here also as a futurist. So yep. let me ask you this. What is, in short, the future of learning, in your opinion? That's a really interesting question. I hope that you have the opportunity to speak to a, another doctor, Dr. Adil Al-Zaruni. Mm -hmm. He leads a school called Citizen School. And they're actually, their concept, their clients of ours, their concept is about the future of learning. And so what they're doing is actually building skill sets and mindsets in young children mm. to explore not the challenges of today, but the challenges of the future. Mm. So developing mental resilience and developing the skill sets and capabilities to be able to address those challenges that we're mm. still not yet facing, but that they will face when they become of adult age. And so when you think about it from a perspective of our stewardship of the earth. We're at the point now where our, our parents are deferring responsibility towards us and every, you know, every generation defers that responsibility uh, forward. And we eventually will have to defer the responsibility to mm. young people. Mm. And when you consider what a sad state of affairs we've mm. left, mm. we've inherited the world from our parents and where the world is going in terms of you know, mm. climate change, in terms of um, in terms of our use of resources, I mean, we're using, you know, 3.8 Earth's worth of resources. Yeah. And it's going to be left, a generation eventually will have to come and say, we have to end this. Mm. So I think what learning will have to entail is the responsibility to address the challenges that we're not yet facing, mm. but everybody can clearly see on the horizon. Climate change is one of them. Use of resources is another. And what's interesting is that there's so much opportunity for innovation that will allow us to harness those challenges and turn them also into commercial opportunities. Yeah. And I think that's what's really exciting. So the future of learning for me is going to be about creating resilient minds that are able to face the challenges of the future and also to develop the commercial opportunities that that will bring about. Dr. Peter Stoyanov, Head of Communications at Black. It is a, an honor to have you here today with us. Uh, thank you for joining Xeno Talks. And uh, this is going to be the first of many conversations that we're going to have. Shal, looking forward to it. Thank you so much for having me. It's been an honor. Thank you. Cheers, brother. Cheers. <laughs>